you. Um, and then Leah has our main talk today. Uh, she's going to discuss bad eyes and bad ears running the family, early onset vision and hearing loss. You can go ahead. Okay, good morning. <laughs> um, I'd like to present a case that I saw and found very interesting uh, in Dr. DeGrace's neuro ophthalmology clinic this year. Um, and it was a, a little girl who was 12. She came in with her mom, and their chief complaint was that the bad eyes and bad ears had been running in the family. They were now affecting the daughter um, at a very early age of 12, and they this is what prompted them to want to know what was going on. So history of this little girl's presentation. Um, she's had, she is now 12 as mentioned, and she's had progressive complaints of decreased vision bilaterally, pretty much equally since age eight. And breaking this down, she complains of blurred vision, equal at distance and near. It's been progressively worsening. It's not uh, associated with pain, any double vision, no ocular injection, no motility deficits that they could see. And then finally, she does have the subjective complaints of decreased hearing, again, pretty equal bilaterally, but she hasn't been formally evaluated. So her clinical course was somewhat brief before we saw her. She was evaluated by a local optometrist in November of 2011. They were unable to refract her uh, with any marked improvement, and so she was referred then to a retinal specialist in the area who uh, concluded it was likely an optic nerve problem and sent her our way. So this patient's general history uh, is pretty unremarkable. She's healthy. She doesn't take medication. She's importantly had no other neurologic history. She's had no head trauma. Um, she's had no eye surgery or eye trauma. She's never required any eye drop medications. She lives in Idaho with her mom. She doesn't use tobacco or alcohol, as she stated with mom present. <laughs> so we, we think that's correct. Um, she does not have, you know, on review of systems, she, she subjectively doesn't have complaints that would point us to other neurologic deficits, no ataxia, vertigo, difficulty swallowing, no seizures, numbness, tingling, headaches, nausea, vomiting, developmental delay, or failure to thrive. And so I left out a um, pertinent part there, which is the family history. And as mentioned, the mom stated that a number of family members have suffered from similar symptoms. But the workup really has been minimal. But when we kind of went through the pedigree, um, this is as far back as we could go, but it was a couple of generations. So we have our affected patient here. But um, going up, she has three aunts, um, well, a mother and two aunts, rather, who have similar subjective symptoms and that this is their age of onset. And again, our patient had complaints as early as age eight. And then her grandfather um, would also apparently had a similar phenotype as did his mother. So we can see that it, it, uh, the presentation is present in each generation and both men and women seem to be affected and it appears here that there's uh, male to female transmission. So on examination of the patient in our clinic, uh, indeed she had a best corrected visual acuity that was 2040 in the right and 2050 in the left, um, but she didn't have any pupillary abnormalities. Her visual field appeared full to confrontation um, and she had full extraocular motility uh, without any diplopia or pain. Her intraocular pressures were normal. Uh, she did have normal stereopsis and color vision, and we did do kind of an expanded assessment of her color vision with a D15 as well, which was uh, fairly normal. Her anterior segment examination was normal. There was no kinsis or any other abnormality. And then, uh, as is commonly done in Dr. Degree's clinic, we did do a full neurologic examination, and that was completely normal. So when we did her dilated fundus examination, though, we were struck by the marked temporal pallor that uh, was present on both optic nerves. But otherwise, there was no evidence of edema, um, and the other uh, retinal structures were all seemingly normal. Uh, on visual field assessment, 
uh, we found that she had kind of a central depression bilaterally uh, when you look kind of at the numbers here. And then uh, in the right eye, she had somewhat of an enlarged blind spot. And then uh, on retina nerve fiber layer assessment, uh, you can see that her nerves are thinned and they're pretty equal bilaterally. So her average thickness is 56 micrometers and you can see that it's most marked in her temporal nerve, which kind of fits the um, appearance of her optic nerve. And given these data, we obtain visually evoked potentials and um, by pattern reversal, we found that they were slowed bilaterally at uh, 108 in the right, 110 in the left. And this uh, correlated nicely with a decreased flicker fusion of both eyes, uh, both optic nerves as well. So putting this all together in uh, a clinical assessment, she's 12 years old and she's had early onset bilateral visual decline, e e uh, somewhat of a sequicentral scotoma with temporal pallor and thinning of the optic nerve. So overall consistent with a bilateral optic atrophy. And uh, in addition, she has the subjective complaint of difficulty hearing. So um, for the sake of my s simplicity of thought, I like to think, take things at uh, one at a time <laughs> and break them down. So w I'll start with the optic atrophy and then we'll kind of see uh, later on how that difficulty hearing might play into things. So thinking of the differential diagnosis of optic atrophy in a child, uh, it is more broad than uh, what I have here, but these are some common things that you would want to think about. Certainly, autosomal dominant optic atrophy would be a consideration, and also glaucoma. You might see more cupping and more elevated intraocular pressures, and usually not a, uh, such a strong familial component. Zebers uh, is uncommon in a woman, in a uh, female, um, and usually, of course, has excellent transmission as a result. Um, and generally the vision uh, is normal and then just drops suddenly first in one eye then the other eye, uh, not as consistent with our history. Uh, a compressive optic neuropathy is a less likely to be bilateral. It would usually be a little bit more progressive uh, in a rapidly progressive. And you wouldn't necessarily expect such a strong family history. The same would be true for infiltrative um, uh, or inflammatory optic nerve pathology where we might expect to see more swelling um, in an acute setting. And then in a toxic or nutritional uh, etiology for an optic neuropathy, we might elicit a toxin exposure. We wouldn't quite see such a strong family history. Um, though, um, as Dan Bettis talked to us about recently, there can be some um, familial components to uh, something like alcohol toxicity. And then optic nerve hypoplasia might be another reason for abnormal optic nerves, but in general, we see a double ring sign and the history is not quite consistent with what we're seeing in this patient. And then um, finally, autosomal recessive optic atrophy. But given the family history and overall presentation of the patient, I think it's safe to say that our leading uh, differential would be the autosomal dominant optic atrophy in this case. So evolution of the diagnosis of this condition, uh, it was originally, well, a hereditary optic atrophy was originally described uh, in the 1800s, but um, uh, Lieber did kind of beat them out on this, but he, in describing an optic atrophy, but he did not distinguish what um, kind of, uh, what the heritable pattern was when he, uh, he first observed the characteristics. So. All in all, it was in the late 1800s that we first started thinking about heritable or hereditary optic atrophy. But then it wasn't until 1959 that a Danish ophthalmologist um, first characterized the autosomal dominant pattern. And that is uh, where we get kind of our diagnosis of autosomal dominant optic, optic atrophy right now. And then um, it did take quite some time for us to really learn more uh, than the heritability of this condition. It wasn't until 1994, 90, 1995 that we did some gene mapping to show that um, the 
mutation was likely correlated uh, with chromosome 3. So um, autosomal dominant optic atrophy is the most common now hereditary optic atrophy. There have been some sporadic cases uh, though due to de novo mutation. So you don't always have to have um, a dominant family history. Um, and it prevalence is about one in 50,000. But interestingly, it's most prevalent in Denmark due to a founder effect. And there's a um, particular mutation that has been traced back to the Viking era that is responsible for the increased prevalence in Denmark. Uh, it's, it's characterized by symmetric loss of the retinal ganglion cell layer leading to the optic neuropathy. And it, um, it's associated, now we know, with mutations in the OPA1 gene, which is the gene at that uh, chromosome three. And um, this was not uh, further elucidated until to about 2000. So it took us some time after we knew chromosome three was involved to understand which gene uh, was actually responsible. Um, several mutations have been identified in this gene. And all in all, about 80 to 90% of people with this phenotype have been shown to have a mutation in OPA1, which is somewhat interesting that it's not 100%, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. So wh uh, what do we know about this gene and why it might cause this disease? It's um, a genomically encoded gene, so not a mitochondrial uh, DNA encoded gene like in Liebert. Um, and it's a dynamin-like uh, mitochondrial DTPA. So it functions within the mitochondria, but it's not encoded in mitochondrial DNA. Um, it's localized, the protein is localized to the mitochondrial inner membrane space. It's ubiquitously expressed, but it does show some increased expression in different tissues, including the retina. <coughs> and in human, the open reading frame is 30 exons. However, as highlighted in blue, there are a couple alternatively spliced exons uh, when you get to the mRNA level. So in total, there are eight mRNAs that can be generated from this one DNA sequence. <coughs> and <coughs> so um, there is further processing once uh, we have a protein in that um, there's cleavage events that occur such that we can generate both a long and short isoform of the protein. And so the long isoform is associated with the inner mitochondrial membrane, but the short isoform is more diffusible. Beyond that, um, we don't have a clear idea of the different roles for each of these. We know that during apoptosis, we see more of the short isoform, but that's more of an observational um, uh, piece of data. We don't have any real functional data as to how one functions over the other. <coughs> so overall, the function of the OPA1 gene, uh, it is important, it has many functions, which makes it um, uh, much more complicated in thinking about the pathophysiology. But firstly, it uh, functions in fusion of mitochondrial membranes. So in tissue culture cells, mitochondrial fusion has been shown to be impaired uh, when we use RNAi to knock out OPA1. And then uh, control of programmed cell death or apoptosis um, is uh, regulated by OPA1. So if we overexpress OPA1, uh, it protects cells from apoptosis induced by intrinsic stimuli, uh, namely caspases. And oxidative phosphorylation, so RNAIs which deplete OPA1 uh, within cells again, uh, demonstrates severe, severely reduced uh, endogenous restoration. And they cannot be stimulated with addition of an uncoupler. And they also have um, decreased oxygen consumption driven by essentially the mitochondria. So uh, finally, OPA1 is thought to be important in maintenance of the mitochondrial DNA. So electron micro microscopy has demonstrated that um, there are changes to the internal membrane structure in OPA1 um, knockout cells, uh, and that this inhibits mitochondrial DNA anchoring to the internal membrane, which is required for replication specifically of the mitochondrial DNA. So this has all been done in tissue culture cells. And we have kind of a schematic of then overall, you can see in general, um, many functions of the mitochondria are uh, 
are reliant on OPA1, it would seem. Um, but uh, what, you know, what do we see in an actual animal model is, is what we see in cells um, transferable to what we can see in an animal model. So they, uh, there have been two OPA1 mutation mice generated. And so one is a frame deletion and one has a premature stop codon. Um, but the data from these is uh, fairly similar. And um, in that, a homozygous mutation is lethal. Um, and a heterozygous mutation, which is really more similar to what we see in the human condition anyway, um, does demonstrate what we um, would expect based on our cell culture and um, to some extent what we see in humans. So <coughs> we see progressive loss of retina, retinal ganglion cells and reduced number of axons with an abnormal shape and myelinization of the axons. And so that is pictured here. And generally you can just see these um, bundles of axons look <coughs> Um, distorted in this picture uh, with the OPA1 heterozygote. And it's quantified here. You can see there's just fewer axons uh, overall. And then structurally, as we mentioned with the electron microscopy in cells, the mitochondria were um, very disorganized in appearance. And we see that also in the mice. So here's a normal mitochondrial structure in a wild type mouse and then the mouse that has the mutation, you can see the mitochondria just don't look appropriate there. And so um, they have correlated this with function to some extent in the mice um, where they uh, use the patterns to have the mice track and see uh, how, to, to see how well they can, their visual function is performing, but um, so they do believe that, as in a human, in the mice, these, uh, these aberrancies result in decreased vision. Um, and finally, with respect to reduced overall cells of the um, ganglion cell layer, we can see here that over time, extending down in the OPA1 mice in this column versus the wild type mice, when we label the retinal ganglion uh, retinal ganglion cells, we can see that there are fewer when we go out 13 months in the uh, OPA1 mutation mice versus the wild type mice. So how does this correlate to people? And it seems to me that it correlates quite well. These are um, some of the classic findings of autosomal dominant optic atrophy. And it's very similar to what we saw in our patients. So we see optic nerve pallor that's most marked in the temporal aspect of the nerve. Um, and there are varying degrees of color vision abnormality, but this is what you might expect with optic nerve pathology. And then on visual field, we have kind of central or supracentral uh, scotomas. But there is a spectrum of what we see uh, within humans. And so overall, we see this insidious mild to moderate vision loss. It does generally start in school age children, which does fit our patient quite well, and um, it does progress throughout life, but the degree of progression is really unclear at this point. There have been a number of studies. I'll touch on one here and then a few others later, but um, over a 10-year period, uh, an Australian population with autosomal dominant optic atrophy and known OPA1 mutations uh, was studied, and you can see that 62% of um, the 30 patients that they looked at uh, did not have a change in their LOGMAR scores over a 10 year period. But they did not stratify by age. So they kind of, they had age range from 10 all the way up to 60. And so we don't know, um, you know, does the progression occur earlier in life and level out? They were not able to uh, assess for something of that sort in their study. But overall, it's kind of striking uh, my understanding of this disease prior to preparing for this talk was that it was just kind of um, progressive throughout life and they would have really bad vision in the end. But um, all in all, the progression is variable and it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that they're going to progress to significant degrees. <coughs> 
And then what's their final visual acuity? It is also quite variable. But in general, 40% um, are about 2060 or better. 45% uh, are between 2060 and 2200. And then the remaining are below 2200. So it really is the minority of people that have severe visual impairment from this condition. And then as we mentioned, a central or supracentral visual defects are most classic, but some individuals have demonstrated altitudinal defects. Um, uh, dyschromatopsia is off often seen um, both within the blue, yellow, and red green spectrum. Optic nerve collar is um, kind of evenly dispersed between just the temporal aspect or the entire nerve. And um, many times you will see peripapillary atrophy and this makes it a little more difficult. You can see an enlarged capture disc ratio and glaucoma can be on your differential. So um, though it can be present in this condition. Um, so why the variability? And one thought that came to mind was maybe it was just more for residents to memorize. But all in all, I think it's more likely that it's due to incomplete penetrance. Um, and the reason for that is, again, unclear, but you could imagine environmental factors play in, the genetic background might have a role, and then the mitochondrial DNA background itself might have a role. And there is a study in support of this where they found a threefold overexpression of the mit mitochondrial haplogroup J in the autosomal uh, dominant optic atrophy patients compared with control patients. <coughs> but the functional significance of this is, is not known, but it's interesting that there is this overrepresentation. And then uh, in addition, there are just a lot of OPA1 mutations. So um, we can see here that uh, throughout the gene, these are kind of uh, schematizing the different regions of the gene, and then you, um, you can see the frequency of detected mutations in that area of the gene. Um, and then overall, what that results in, in terms of what the protein looks like. So there are proteins that, that just have missing mutations versus premature truncation, which is the most common, commonly seen uh, mutation result. Um, but these, we don't understand, we don't understand really exactly um, how OPA1 is performing its different roles that we've detected in both our cell culture and in the animal models. We don't exactly know the mechanism. Um, and so it makes it difficult to correlate these all of these mutations to what we see in the clinical setting. But uh, we have kind of observed uh, and categorized some of the variability that we've seen in the phenotype into specific syndromes. And then from that, we've um, made some correlations between specific syndromes and specific mutations in OPA1. So <coughs> we can see here there's just kind of straight dominant optic atrophy um, without any other factors or phenotype. There's a reversible uh, condition that was described only in one patient by only one person. And so it's in the field, it seems like people might not believe that, but it remains to be seen. And this has been correlated with this specific mutation. And then um, importantly here, there's uh, autosomal dominant optic atrophy and deafness. And that's what this D stands for. And it's thought to be an optic neuropathy with an auditory neuropathy as well. Plus and minus perhaps some um, extraocular motility deficit phantosis. But this has been uh, correlated with a very specific mutation in OPA1. In fact, this is the um, highest correlation between any specific dominant optic atrophy phenotype and a specific OPA1 mutation. So I'd like to um, speak a little bit more about that since uh, our patient did, as you remember, present also with some complaints of subjective decreased hearing. So <coughs> uh, in 1974, actually, there was a f the first description of dominant optic atrophy with deafness. And then um, there are some strong ties to Utah, which I also thought was pretty interesting. Um, in 1984, a researcher named Tress uh, described this syndrome where there was uh, dominant optic atrophy and also uh, hearing loss with ptosis, extraocular motility deficits, ataxia, myopathy. 
but still at this point it wasn't quite known um, what the genetic basis was. But uh, this syndrome was again described in a Belgian family. And then in 2003, um, there were a handful of patients identified with this uh, phenotype uh, who had extensive genetic testing and we identified this particular mutation R4458, which is just a change in the amino acid at this position um, in the OPA1 gene. And subsequently to that, um, Dr. Warner and Dr. Katz and um, Dr. Zong uh, did additional testing on the Utah family and the Belgium family um, with respect to this mutation and identified this mutation in all members of those two families. So providing very good data that um, that mutation was in fact responsible for the phenotype we were seeing. And then finally, another Ohio family was reported uh, more recently, again, um, in collaboration with the Cleveland Clinic in um, Utah, that showed uh, an uh, autosomal dominant optic atrophy with just deafness and this mutation. So it didn't have all of the other uh, phenotypes. <coughs> so even within this um, very correlative data, there is some variability, but that seems to be kind of the rule <laughs> with OPA1, as I've uh, uh, learned through my studies. But um, some of the sentinel work, which was um, described by Payne et al. Uh, in 2004 here at the university, uh, shows that these, these are the patients that were assayed, uh, and you can see that their visual acuity is really quite varied, as you mentioned. Their optic atrophy in terms of appearance is somewhat varied. Their hearing loss, while present, is somewhat varied, uh, not present in all. Um, their color testing, again, somewhat varied, but generally uh, diminished. And then uh, many of these patients had the uh, extracular motility deficits and mitosis, but not all, as you can see here. Uh, which kind of correlates more with our patient. And then uh, this is the mutation that they mapped in the DNA of these patients. And in addition, they did a comprehensive audiology study showing hearing loss uh, versus control, which is this picture. And this is just some representative patients. So uh, further characterization um, has been somewhat minimal of this mutation in terms of really understanding exactly why it's correlated so closely with this phenotype. But what we do know is that it's a mutation located in the BCPH domain, which is kind of the, you know, um, all domains are technically important. You know, we have a mitochondrial targeting sequence. If you don't have that, you're not going to ever get to the mitochondria to do your job. But in, you know, the GTPase is kind of the bismuth part of the protein and what actually gets the job done. So it's a very important location for mutation. Uh, resultant change in protein and function is, is not really confirmed or definitively known. But what we have seen is <coughs> through phosphorus magnetic resonance spectroscopy, we uh, were able to see that the rate of ATP production was significantly impaired in skeletal muscle. And this was taken from the patients. It wasn't done in tissue culture. So they have less ATP, which you could imagine would be important for nerve cells. Um, <coughs> And then um, the mitochondria from fibroblasts taken again from these patients uh, demonstrated that the mitochondrial network was very fragmented. And we would have expected that based on our animal studies, but it's nice to see that in a, an actual patient. But it's quantified here based upon the total size of the uh, tubules. But you can see here that this is another OPA1 mutation. And this is the mutation found in this particular phenotype. And it's even more severe in terms of how fragmented the mitochondria are than, um, than the other, this other mutation, which is uh, fairly common. And finally, um, with respect to why the hearing might be uh, decreased, uh, fluorescence imaging has demonstrated a high concentration of OPA1 in the cochlea. And um, with co-labeling of cytochrome C, which we know is present uh, in mitochondria, and these are cochleal uh, hair cells here, we see that um, there's co-localization within the mitochondria of the OPA1 and the cytochrome C, not within the nucleus, which is what we would expect. 
And so functionally, it's still um, not definitively shown what role this would play, but uh, we can draw correlations from these data. And in fact, in patients, we have uh, continued to, to draw correlations with specifically cochlear function, not just overall hearing. And so this is a tracing in, of uh, two individuals who were shown to have this particular mutation as well as uh, the phenotype of optic atrophy and hearing loss alone. And we can see that they're specifically their cochlear function uh, is impaired in both cases. So <coughs> as an academic point though, it, it seems that um, our patient is fitting very nicely into the dominant optic atrophy with deafness. Um, we don't have genetic information on her to know if she has this mutation. So in thinking of what other things this could be, um, there are other uh, syndromes that involve optic atrophy and hearing impairment. So this particular syndrome, which I won't attempt to say, uh, is X-linked and it's characterized by deafness, dystonia, and optic atrophy. So in our patient, we didn't really see dystonia um, and certainly the, the pattern was not an X-linked pattern. Again, we, we can find an X-linked uh, Charcot-Marie-Tooth uh, disease uh, number five, we can see optic atrophy with deafness and a polyneuropathy, which our patient did not appear to have at this time. And, and again, the X-linked pattern was, was not consistent with our history. Um, in Gustavin syndrome, I think uh, it's a, another X-linked syndrome, but it's also characterized by mental retardation and seizures, and our patient did not have that. And then there's a Wolfram syndrome that has two types, and it's an, classically, it's an autosomal recessive mutation um, in this particular gene, which is important for um, calcium transport. And it causes diabetes mellitus as well as insipidus, optic atrophy, and deafness. So our patient did not have evidence of these other conditions. Um, and it didn't appear that it was a recessive transmission. There's a second type with a different a gene involved, but the syndrome is the same. And then of course, dominant optic atrophy. But interestingly, you know, I did mention that not all of the people with opti dominant optic atrophy have been shown to have OPA1 mutations. And so there is, uh, I think, still a lot we need to know about this uh, condition and Maybe there are other loci that modify OPA1, either transcription or translation, such that uh, a mutation in that site would have an effect on OPA1 expression. And that could be a, a reason why we're not picking up the mutation in our current studies. But also, perhaps other genes um, that don't affect OPA1 could have a similar phenotype. And one such gene is this WFS1 gene, which is the Wolfram syndrome gene but recently a novel mutation has, uh, in this gene, has been shown to have autosomal dominant inheritance pattern with optic atrophy and hearing loss. And um, these are some of the eight programs from that study. And you can see that diabetes was not really prominent as, as with the other Wolfram syndromes, um, but you did see quite a bit of color vision deficit, optic uh, atrophy and hearing impairment. So <clears throat> there's still quite a bit we need to learn about this condition. And I think that really plays into what we tell patients in terms of pro prognosis and treatment considerations. So prognosis is really varied. I mean, um, we've seen several examples of the variability of uh, visual acuity. Um, there was a nice study that was done in 1993 and it was 20 individuals, but they were studied over 16 years, which is the longest study I was able to find <clears throat> and their visual acuity range from 2020, which was in several people, but it was kind of within the same family, a, a man with uh, fa affected father and three affected children, and then um, to 2400 and some of the other individuals. But the median initial visual acuity was 2060, and um, the average age of enrollment was in the mid-20s, actually, for this study. <clears throat> So we don't know at onset necessarily what their visual acuity was, but the median final visual acuity was 2080, which I think is pretty interesting. I mean, it's not a significant change over a 16 year period. Um, and you can see here that in 
really in approximately 65% of the patients, um, they were unchanged or only decreased by one smell and line. And um, in 15%, though, uh, you did have more, more drastic visual decline. And this is really in agreement with the initial findings, the sentinel data of the 19 families that were described in 1959 uh, that were followed over a 10-year period and visual loss progressed in only 50% and was moderate, but we don't have such nice uh, delineation of data from the sentinel literature. So <coughs> uh, there's no treatment though. I mean, we can uh, discuss with the patients what we think will be their course, but there's no treatment at this time. I think more work on OPA may uh, help, help us to understand the pathophysiology and, and develop treatments in the future, but at this time we don't have any. Um, we certainly should be helping people to access low vision aids. We can offer genetic analysis, which we did in the case of our patient, and sh so she has been enrolled in iGene because uh, if we detect a specific mutation and in the future we're able to target that mutation therapeutically, uh, may be helpful either to the patient or to their um, family. And um, finally, abstinence from alcohol, tobacco, and a vitamin regimen, um, as Dan again talked about a couple of weeks ago, is important just to minimize other risk factors for optic nerve injury. And then uh, in patients who have hearing loss, cochlear implants, uh, in the, the final study I showed you where it was a cochlear dysfunction of uh, their hearing loss, the cochlear implants have been shown to um, improve their hearing exponentially. So that's a very good option uh, for these patients. It was interesting in our, in our patient, we did send her for audiology and it was normal. <laughs> so, but you know, she still felt like it was decreased and everyone else in her family did. So maybe down the line, sh you know, she'd have a, a measurable decline in her vision. Um, and then another thing to think about, some of the case cases that Frost and Cain initially uh, presented in the literature, some of that ophthalmoplegia was uh, onset within like middle age and none of her family members had had that that the mother knew about, but I think that's another good reason to follow this patient. She may develop something like that, which would be very unfortunate, but um, that might be why there is a spectrum. Maybe some of the uh, aspects of this phenotype are more late onset. So with that, I'll take any questions and I'll take any opportunity to put my son up. <laughs> gene and it's actually important for calcium metabolism and um, so I don't know why there's a specific correlation with that phenotype but it's not an OPA1 phenotype. Is that your question? No, the, the one that I presented, um, so the Wolfram does not have OPA1, it has the WFF1 gene which is important for calcium metabolism um, but uh, the, and that's usually a, an autosomal recessive inheritance pattern of the diabetes and the autosomal atrophy or the optic atrophy. Um, but um, the w there was a new mutation that was described that seemed to show a dominant transmission of optic atrophy and hearing loss, but within the WFF mutation. So that one is has not really been characterized in this literature. But they didn't 